you very much. I don't know how I can give uh, wisdom in five minutes. And um, I'm one of the victims uh, that uh, Dr. Elias was talking about because I thought my presentation was uh, to be at 12.45. Um, but then I read the time wrong. Anyway, um, I don't have a whole lot of time. Uh, thank you so much for this invitation, as you've been uh, told. My name is George Morara. I work with the Kenya National Commission on Human Rights as a commissioner. And also, um, I'm the vice chairperson of that commission. We've been um, barely in office now for about uh, four months because it took such a long time for uh, our commission to be established. And most people just remember Hassan Omar, Maina Kiai. That is the commission that is remembered. Uh, but we've just uh, come in office, and I think we're doing, um, we'll, we'll catch up and do well. Um, I just want to share a few thoughts because um, of the time that I have in terms of um, developing a human rights approach uh, to the issues of the right to food. And I'll start by saying that the right to food is not based or should not be based on vague and replaceable policy goals, which may be subject to periodic redefinitions, but, it, but rather that that right must be based on comparatively specific and continuously becoming more precise obligations undertaken by governments. Those obligations that are undertaken by governments must be based on legal standards, as the previous speaker said, and also on principles uh, that she was quoting. And therefore, <clears throat> realizing the right to food should be part and parcel of a rights-based approach. But when we talk about a rights-based approach, what exactly do we mean? A rights-based approach is a framework for the pursuit of human development that integrates the norms, principles, standards, and goals of international human rights system into the plans and processes of development or programming. It is based on human rights standards and principles, which we all know or we've interacted with uh, previously. And these human rights standards and principles are the universality and inalienability of rights, the indivisibility and interdependence of rights, inclusion and non-discrimination, participation and empowerment, and lastly, transparency and accountability. But having said that, and maybe uh, Dr. Elias will forgive me for saying this, uh, he was very optimistic and hopeful, and with all due respect to um, the politicians and the other policymakers, I think one of the main causes of, uh, there are two main causes that lead to the pre uh, preventing the realization of human rights. And one of them is lack of political will. I want to interpret that uh, the senators can't be too far. They, they, they have planes and all that, and the governors and all that. If they took this as a serious matter, they would be here to tell us their point of view. But again, it's been uh, acknowledged in the past that lack of political will is a key contributor to the failure to realize human rights. Another big issue is insufficient capacities among both duty bearers and <coughs> rights holders. And as human rights practitioners, we always tend to focus on the rights holders without also looking at the ability and capacity of the duty bearers, the people we are asking to um, meet the human rights that we are calling for. So when we, we adopt a human rights-based approach, what we aim to achieve is the following. We want to achieve sustainability, especially the right to food. We want to focus on the poor, the marginalized, and the most vulnerable. We want to increase partnerships and community or citizenship, uh, citizen participation. And we also want to allow services to be given as a matter of right and not a matter of charity. Therefore, in conclusion, uh, I just quickly to, 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 to conclude on the aims of uh, human rights uh, based approach, we must always understand that it focuses on the most vulnerable, the root causes of the problem, rights holders and duty bearers, and it also seeks to empower communities. Now, having talked about the most vulnerable, who do we consider to be the most vulnerable? I think 
in whatever uh, laws we come up with, we must clearly define who the most vulnerable groups are or people are in society in relation to the rights to food. We must come up with activities that target them and we should strive to increase empowerment of the, uh, the vulnerable. And the outcome should always be the improvement of human rights situation of the disadvantaged groups. Having said that, let me just quickly share with you what I think um, is a very progressive development in Kenya in relation to the right to food. Previously, the right to food fell under what we are calling the economic, social, and cultural rights. We were a system and a country that focused more on civil and political rights, where we are talking about uh, people in detention, people, uh, um, the right to not to be tortured and all that. But now we have a new constitution. Is it still new? We have a constitution that is relatively new that makes the right that we call the ECOSOC rights, economic and social cultural rights, rights that are justiciable, which means they are also rights just like the other rights. And I think the government has done fairly well, has come up with some uh, programs to really realize that right, because we have it established in Article 43, uh, C of the Constitution, but then having that article there without having the framework for its implementation may not be very useful. And I'd be very, uh, I, I hope to be here tomorrow to listen to what Senator Elach, uh, Beatrice Elachi will be saying, because she's currently sponsored a bill, and for me that will be a groundbreaking bill in terms of securing the right to food uh, security in this country. And in that bill, very quickly, uh, the bill was published on the 6th of May, 2014, and it's uh, called the Food Security Bill of 2014. I think the bill is very important because it points out the relevant parts of the law, like I said, Article 43.1c, which speaks to the freedom from hunger and the right to adequate food, and not only adequate food, but food of acceptable quality. That bill establishes what we're going to call uh, the Food Security Authority, with, among other functions, whose other functions, um, uh, with a very elaborate uh, set of functions that have been given out. But then the bill goes ahead to define in very clear terms when you talk about access, what exactly do we mean? And the bill says, access means the physical, economic, and social access by a person or, or households to food through production, purchase, or state programs to ensure the right to food. The bill also tells us what adequate food means, because we can't just talk about adequate food without the framework of what does adequate food mean. And it talks about adequate food would mean the availability of food in both quantity and quality sufficient to satisfy the dietary needs of the individuals. Most importantly for, most importantly for this country, and we all know this, it talks about food that should be free from adverse substances and acceptable within a given culture. I'm saying this because we are the country of, we all know about the aflatoxin and all that. So it has to be food that is free uh, from adverse substances of that kind. The bill also defines the people that we call the at-risk persons or the food poor. And who are the, the at-risk persons or the food poor? It sets out um, to define those ones as those ones without a competent social support system to access food. And it goes ahead to define like the question that has been asked. You ask that question when we always go downtown and we find people asking for food and all this. Whose responsibility is, this, is that? And here, when you're talking about those ones without a competent social support system, the bill limits these ones to those ones who have familial or other legal duties to those persons there. But uh, being in um, um, one of the most um, progressive religious institutions, I think the moral aspect also comes in. So the morality of the food and all that, we can't avoid that. Then it, it also says that people could be, um, could not have a competent social system either because they are infants uh, or because they are lactating mothers, pregnancy, they are elderly, or they could be suffering from other forms of infirmity. And I've seen uh, people like Wakina Joe who have started to maybe respond to these issues um, by what we're calling uh, the Maziwa Yajoho. Uh, the government is busy telling us about um, 
the supplements that are being given to lactating mothers, mothers and I think these are some of the, the measures that are being taken. But in a nutshell, because I don't have a whole lot of time, it's just to point you to this bill, which as a commission we will be engaging in very closely because I think it gives us a very good framework now then to actually move forward from talking about the rights in the Constitution to establishing a framework for the realization of the same through the establishment of the Food Security Authority. And it also sets out a very clear framework even at the county level. And as a commission, we will be closely uh, monitoring this to make sure that um, uh, we are food secure. Allow me to conclude by, saying the by making the following comment. That um, when we are talking about the right to food, we should make sure that we focus on providing services, especially from a humorous perspective, that focus on services that work for the poor. And these ones will be driven by the following factors, the following three factors. One, we should encourage a framework for citizens, for citizens, politicians, and policymakers to participate, whereby citizens give the government the mandate, and the Constitution allows us to do that, to protect food rights and to set standards and monitor or create information to ensure food security. Two, we should create a framework that allows politicians and policymakers to talk and other frontline providers so that they can set standards for performance, provide budgets and authority, and set up information systems to monitor performance and sanction failures for those ones who don't um, uh, do their bit. Finally, we should ensure that citizens and frontline providers uh, interact in a way that then citizens are able to make claims on the providers of food security and uh, on those ones who are supposed to provide them uh, with the right to food, and also that citizens have a system for providing feedback about performance and to take direct action when, uh, when services fail. And the anticipated bill by uh, Madam Senator Beatrice Elachi clearly sets out the framework for doing that. Thank you so much.